Hello and welcome to YHTV's Magical Medical Tour. This is episode 28. I'm Christina Suzuma, and with me is our wonderful medical guide, Dr. Glenn Woolman. Hello, hello, Glenn. Hello, Christina, and greetings, everyone. Welcome to Magical Medical Tour. I am Dr. Glenn Wallman. I will be your medical guide as we travel today through the healthcare galaxy, searching for ways to achieve optimal health. What's Here's going on, Christina? Journey. Well, what's going on? Yep. You know, it, it's ever, ever going and spinning and moving in our wonderful, fast-paced world. Yeah, uh, we do have a, a interesting world that we all live in. Yes. Uh, I was thinking about uh, your program, Trinity, Trinity of Life. And you do so many things like that in your general life, but giving the opportunity to meet with other people and have them meet uh, the rest of the global community. What, uh, what's that done for you? Oh, it's, it's, it's been amazing, like Magical Medical Tour. I mean, I, I've always mm -hmm. wanted to be like, a, a st I, I feel like I learn pieces of things and it's like the tip of the iceberg. Everything is like just droplets from the iceberg of all these different areas. Mm. And, and it, with all these, the experts, with all the, the masters, with all the wisdom keepers that, that, you know, and I, and that's how I feel about doctors. I mean, they're wisdom keepers and, you know, they're ever challenging mm -hmm. themselves to the next level and the next level. And, and <clears throat> all this knowledge is just so exciting. I mean, I get so jazzed by it. That I want more. I want more. So <clears throat> I can't wait to expand all of this. And of course, then we have these wonderful, inspiring um, individuals. Uh, for example, recently we interviewed Ms. Phyllis Sues, an 89-year-old lovely woman who started yoga at 83 years old. Wow. And from yoga to dancing tango to <clears throat> arranging and composing her first two CDs. And I think she was 84 when she did that and then also now she's uh she's just stopped trapezing if you can trapezing. believe that <laughs> stop wow. trapezing and she's 89 and just just understanding this wealth of life that she's lived and wanting to live more i mean inspirational people like that i mean what more can i ask for glenn but to be surrounded by magnificent magnificent beings yeah, it's good to know that because I think so much of the time, if we watch the news and read papers and everything, um, there's not always these. It seems like there's a more balance on the other end of the unmagnificent people. So, so to say, unmagnificent, right? <laughs> yeah. And so it'd be nice. It's nice to have the opportunity to bring out magnificent people, and that's, uh, I think, what we're going to do today. Uh, one of the things you know that we try and do with Magical Medical Tour is explore different aspects of the healing arts. Mm -hmm. And today we have a very special aspect. It's uh, osteopathy. Uh, some people have heard of that. Many people have not heard of that. But I thought it would be important for us to talk about and learn about and uh, see if it's, you know, it's a branch of medicine and healing, certainly. So, uh, People should be afforded the opportunity to consider different things depending on what their needs were. And today, uh, when I introduce to you our guest, Dr. Timothy Schultz, uh, he'll give us some uh, information that may help us uh, as we do explore the healthcare galaxy. So uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Timothy Schultz. Timothy, meet Christina. Hello, Christina. Hello, Dr. Schultz. Welcome, and thank you for honoring us here on Magical Medical Tour. Oh, thank you for inviting me. This wasn't voluntary, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we, we did, does he have you chained to the chair? <laughs> you, you can only see a very small fragment of me at this moment. <laughs> Hopefully, I feel my whole self. But that's, that's what I'm looking forward to during the course of this conversation. <laughs> To feeling your full self? Full self. I hope that will happen. <laughs> no, no, so, Tim, the way I usually like to do things as the medical guide, I like to tell our uh, global community and viewing audience uh, the path that I intend to take, knowing full well that uh, it could go anywhere. 
but usually I like to uh, have our guests, our viewers meet you and understand a little bit about your journey. Then I specifically want to talk about uh, osteopathy, its history, what it, what's going on with it, some of your training. Then I want to go into uh, what's happening these days, what you're doing, and talk about uh, medicine and osteopathy and, and things that osteopathy offers to uh, our global community for health, and then uh, go from there. How's that sound to you? I should call you Copernicus or Galileo. <laughs> uh, I, Copernicus. I think Galileo was uh, was uh, tortured. <laughs> so I don't really want to do that. So one of the things that we talk about with all of our guests is we try and find out where, when, how, why, what, what made you become just a healer? What what brought you into the healing arts? Where were you inspired by that? Can you tell us a little about that today? Yeah, if I had to, you know, if this was fourth down coming up and I had to kick the ball since I don't like football in the least bit, <laughs> I would probably say that uh, the word in between frames kind of what got me into uh, and to me, I think healing is a is a term that I, I probably wouldn't use for myself because I actually kind of climbed up the ladder of science in order to embody uh, as much information as I could from a Western perspective, because that was uh, kind of the tradition that I grew up in. And then uh, osteopathy became kind of the vehicle that allowed me to, I mean, I guess if somebody else called me a healer, I wouldn't be so insulted point, which is fine. Whereas I think uh, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, I definitely <clears throat> would have had chills coming up my back. <laughs> so what got me into uh, Western medicine was, uh, I think most people decide what to do with their life based on their circumstances when they're young. And I had a, a parental team that was a dichotomy. Uh, they were parallel as, as a mother and father, but one was an artist who raised children. I never got to express her art, and the other was named Art, but he was a cardiologist, so uh, you can see why I love words, it's just they were always flying around me. Uh, her name was Ruth, and I, I I can't but help think that there was a T somewhere missing in her <laughs> voyage, and his name was Art, and I think it went to heart. I won't, I won't go where it might have been otherwise. <laughs> so I was inspired by that dichotomy between feminine and masculine uh, in their embodiment, they were a, a very Western dogmatized uh, cardiologist and kind of a, a, a Kentucky housewife who migrated from Illinois. So as she uh, aged and got sick in her 60s, I decided to come back home and take care of her in her final days. Mm. And that journey allowed me to see both sides closer uh, as kind of a gap junction between uh, the the mother and the father, the father who tried to be a good doctor but had to be a husband as well. So it was a, it began as a personal journey. And that seeded, if you'd want to say it, fortified the seed in, in my resolution to stay with a path that was so difficult that uh, most people, as my father told me, uh, he wouldn't wish medicine on his worst enemy because it isn't necessarily an easy route for a lot of people to take and especially someone with an artistic disposition. Anyway, that, that I think led me into the, the healing arena. And uh, if you want to say that the achievement of BA, being able to measure up to the expectations of what both parents, I think, planted from a very early age and then kind of finding myself in the stream without knowing exactly why I got there. The information came later because all the little pieces were floating around me. How did the information come to you? Uh, you mean the little floating pieces of driftwood? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, occasionally there's a leaf and maybe an old inner tube. And Well, that's my favorite. You've got that. Okay, so there is, uh, people would always ask, why did you become an osteopath? And they used to think I was joking because I, I do tend to like to do that. But I wasn't joking at all. I said I like the letter O. And it seems like a casual response, you know, it says inner tubish. <laughs> but the, the idea that somebody can be drawn to shape is not 
outrageous. There's a, in, I think it's a, a psychology term, there's something called implicit egoism. And if you have a name, uh, say for instance, that symbolically stands for something, and you, uh, for instance, find yourself becoming a dentist, you have no idea your dad wasn't a dentist, you look up in the phone book, if you look up, there's more than random significance that, that most dentists or most dentists don't start with the name Dennis or Denise. However, you'll find a, a statistically higher number of people who are dentists that start with uh, Dennis and Denise. <laughs> they had no idea why they chose dentistry. So I think there's circumstantial, and we, we as a, an embodiment of our embryologic origins carry things with us in the stream that we have little consciousness about, but keep on bubbling up from below as we find ourselves kind of on our own pilgrimage, our own odyssey. And I think when you take a chance, and when I took a risk with going to medical school, choosing kind of a painful road that I didn't really want to go down as a kid, people would say, what do you want to be when you grow up? I said anything but a doctor, because it was the farthest this part of, of my essence that I thought I wanted to embody. And that was unfortunately, or fortunately, you know, at the same time, a, a good journey to be on and still is. Mm. So did you go to medical school? Yes. I, uh, that, that gets into the, what is an osteopath? And I still don't understand why, um, why we, why we as a culture don't have a better uh, definition of what osteopathy is. I know why we well, don't. I can answer that because Magical Medical Tour and Trinity of Life never existed. But but now, after today, there will be a great answer. Not that there's pressure on you, but go ahead. A great, G-R-E-Y-E-D, or a great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, come on, Yorick. I'm an, I'm an optimist, but you know, I start with the letter O again. <laughs> you see, it, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm circular in my thinking. But so, where, where do we begin with osteopathy? I think yeah, what first, did you finish medical school, or did you move? Did you recognize osteopathy as the path during medical school? Um, the kickoff, you know, when I had to punt and become re-engaged back into the medical school curriculum, I was applying to MD and DO schools when I found out that there was equal licensure in all 50 states, and there was legally no difference between an MD and a DO. And I read the philosophy behind osteopathy. I, I had to question why anybody would want to, and at least in my shoes, go through the path of becoming an MD. So I felt it qualified me for both beating them and joining them at the same time. And uh, I was just surprised that I'd never heard of it, you know, and I had made it through 22 or 23 years of life. Um, <laughs> I was, I mean, to me, I, I didn't know why it was kept underground because it was so legal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's, that's a, a perfect a segue. Uh, many people have some idea of what it is, and some people have no idea. So please enlighten us. Give us a little of the history of osteopathy and uh, what kind of uh, philosophy it is that uh, appealed to you so much, and let's move from there. And you can always herd me back on course. Don't I mean? I know there's a little lag time with the uh, the streaming, but uh, if I get too far off course, just hit me back. <laughs> Christina will do that. <laughs> <laughs> so osteopathy began with a, a, a frontier physician um, whose name was Andrew Taylor Still. He was born in the 1830s, and his heyday was during the Civil War. Uh, he essentially was trained as a frontier doctor under the tutelage of his Methodist minister father. Uh, and usually there was a, a training that you'd mentor with someone, and then you did academic medicine a little bit later, at least in Europe, that's how they handled it. Uh, surgeons were usually thought of as unskilled physicians because they did, they, they did such brutal things. Um, as A.T. still became, uh, if you want to say, as he matured in his 30s, I think by the time he was 37 or 38, he had lost four children to meningitis and other infectious diseases. And uh, the amount of burden on this person as a physician must have been enormous. So he decided that there had to be a different way to think about the human body 
as a pharmacopoeia, a kind of an internal pharmacy of things that one could reach through the musculoskeletal system. He did that by digging up uh, bones of ancestors, uh, I think sometimes with permission, sometimes without, and studied the human body. He was probably one of the best anatomists at, at the turn of the century um, from the standpoint of just actually knowing information about what blood vessel went where. So in his quest, he started to treat the body as a, um, we want to say, as, as a form that affects function. So as he worked with his patients and found that uh, occasionally you could do something to the physical body that would, would render a physiologic change. You could treat a baby who had flux, which was incessant diarrhea from cholera, and you could treat that baby and get a better result than the neighbor whose child died. So he had, uh, if you'd want to say, practical experience with infection, with trauma, with uh, things that weren't understood because things as the, as the x-ray machine hadn't even come to the forefront of medicine. So he came up with a model of the body based on anatomy uh, and carried that to his, the next generation of his students in 1892 when he started a school with a Scottish anatomist. Through that course, uh, they trained, I think, 17 or 18 people the first year, half of which were women uh, to kind of go out after a two-year study program and start to work with people as a soma, as a physical embodiment of, of uh, if you'd want to say, the, the patient became the laboratory. The disease was in interesting and influential, but the laboratory was what you needed to study. So he, he aligned himself with Western medicine in surgery and physiology in the way that he studied uh, anatomy. But at the same time, he believed that the, the medications that they were stumbling on at the time usually led to their demise, the patient's demise. Uh, and he wanted to kind of clean that up from, the, from the, a non-allopathic standpoint. So the word allopath means of an MD persuasion. The word osteopath is kind of a strange word. It's non-allopathic, uh, and it belongs to, to the tradition of other modalities, such as homeopathy, uh, chiropractic. Um, mm. But it is the only branch of non-allopathic medicine that's fully licensed to do surgery, to prescribe medications, to manage patients for any condition that they would be managed by an, an equivalent trained MD. So that was, uh, anyway, that was his introduction to the American culture. What happened from that point on was a lot of fighting until probably, I think the last state to legalize osteopathy, if you want to call it legalization, to give us full licensure was North Carolina, and that was as late as 1979. Wow. Yes, I remember working in hospitals at, at one point, uh, suddenly there were a number of of uh, osteopathic doctors that came in, and there were a few little skirmishes here and there between the medical staff. How many things could they allow them to do? Did they have to be monitored by someone else? And then suddenly it uh, that disappeared also, and there were uh, everyone was on committees together, and people were doing surgery next to each other. Uh, there seemed to be no difference at one point, whereas at the beginning we had no doctors of osteopathy when I first started in medical school and uh, working in the hospitals. So what what is, uh, you talk about it has to do with illness or disease has to do with form and function. Is that is that where that goes or is there more to that? Um, there is more to that because the, the idea of osteopathy um, being rested in the, the physical soma of a person is it's reduced to anatomy because that's the easiest way to study it. If you are serious about um, gaining uh, intellectual intimacy with the body. I mean, if you don't understand shape, uh, you have a hard time conceptualizing. If you don't know your hip joint is round, for instance, if you're a practitioner, you're in trouble, but if you're a uh, patient, you're still in trouble. <laughs> because occasionally, if you can merge the two systems so that the role of a, a physician is a teacher, the role of an osteopath is to, from a palpation standpoint, to educate their patients as well as they can 
about as as though you were an owner's manual about the, the body that you have, both from a, an experiential standpoint, as well as from an intellectual standpoint, using, again, the models that Western medicine proposes, and then coming up with some of our own hypotheses and models about what integrates the body as a whole mechanism, um, things that even Western science and neuroscience, neurobiology uh, is only starting to bridge. I mean, in, in the most, uh, I think it's still in the infancy stages, but they're starting to conceptualize incredible models for how the hand is really part of the brain. It's no longer a thing that's way down there on, as a uh, you know, cleaning device at the end of a long pole that's getting cobwebs off the 14 foot ceilings that we operate in. Did I go anywhere uh, too distant from the source? <laughs> I, I was just in a cobweb. Right. <laughs> so I'm back now. Thank you for bringing me back. Oh, my poetry uh, teacher. I so. still want to get more of the concepts of osteopathy. So maybe I can ask you this question. Uh, when I was reviewing your biography under teachings, you had something titled Expanding the Osteopathic Concept. And, and I'm assuming that was a course or something that you taught and gave back to new students. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. That's okay, so when I, when I read that, expanding the osteopathic concept, I went off in two directions. One was the direction as if you were spreading the word of osteopathy, and the other was taking uh, what – is it Dr. Still? Yes, yeah, what Dr. Still brought into the program and then expanding that into the 21st century. So which or is it a combination of the two of those is it that you teach? How long, how long do you have? <laughs> the, the expanding the osteopathic concept was a carefully chosen set of words um, so that it was the, I mean, back all the way up. You did definitely go two different directions, but neither one were correct. <laughs> Excellent. The, it's good. The, at the very beginning, osteopathy realized the bones and the blood vessels, everything was related. There was reciprocal tensions in the body that people studied, and they studied it with their five fingers on each hand. Uh, being a 10-fingered osteopath in the olden days was the common practice, whereas now let me just kind of distinguish, and I'll tell you where we're going again. But first, currently, if I would call myself an osteopath, it's kind of like saying I'm an allopath. Most people would lose what I actually do because I'm not really defining. I'm, I'm defining the style of practice rather than what my license is. So if I said I was an osteopathic physician that specialized in neuromusculoskeletal medicine, you, you already cleared the room by then. Nobody even cares. <laughs> So that's unfortunately how complicated it's gotten. Even though we're supposed to be very general in our training, if you if you don't become specific, like in the licensure that I have, I'm board certified in neuromusculoskeletal medicine, which means I practice medicine, but I am trained philosophically and both practically as an osteopathic physician with 10 fingers. That's my legacy, and if you want to call it my uh, cultural legacy to the original, the originator of osteopathy. So I still feel like I have a tradition that I'm keeping in line. Uh, I'm still an oak tree. I might be a California oak, a little extra nutty. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still have roots that go all the way back to 1890, 1892, or maybe 1874 when the, the banner of osteopathy was flung to the breezes. Um, so anyway, I'll go back to expanding osteopathic concept is a term that tried to clarify the difference between what an osteopath does when he treats or she treats the cranium versus when a lay practitioner or a, uh, somebody studying cranial psychotherapy uh, teaches a course in cranial osteopathy. In the 1930, uh, as far back as 1930, Dr. Still's student, Dr. Uh, William Garner Sutherland, started to teach students about the cranial concept. And the cranial concept was kind of looked at as heresy at the very beginning because it was a model. And people thought that the cranium could not move. How, how can you move a solid bone? And until he disarticulated it with the 
pen knife and found that the, the joints were actually unusually uh, mobile in certain individuals on autopsy, and that occasionally the if you soaked beans inside the cranium, the, the skull would disarticulate from the inside rather easily. But if you tried to pry it apart from the outside, no can do. Mm. So the cranial concept came onto the osteopathic map in the 1930s. It was extricated from most of the common circles of this is this is common sense. We use anatomic landmarks, things that we know through anatomy, but this cranial stuff is a little bit off the chart. There wasn't a lot of neural research at the time, nor a lot of imaging to study. So by the time he started teaching, when he realized his dreams weren't just an idle, his ideas weren't an idle dream, he, he came up with kind of a cloistered group of people that got what he was saying, had a, an experience of it, and actually put some of that into practice with patients. Uh, they were extraordinarily excited about their model. And as they uh, perpetuated the model, it became kind of a parallel universe with the rest of the osteopathic perfection profession. Some people got it and some people didn't. Some people could feel what Dr. Sutherland was talking about and other people just thought it was still under investigation um, mm -hmm. and it still is under investigation. So the concept, when we would teach the courses, usually with Dr. Freiman through the Western University, which was then a different name, she wanted to make sure that people understood that we were furthering the concept of osteopathy by teaching the cranial concept and didn't want to use such of a specific name. So sorry for that, but it is, it's, it's an important detail, but it's a detail of a detail of a detail. And it's a, I don't feel like MC Escher would be... Uh, he would be rapping about that now. <laughs> so sorry, Glenn. That was a, a long uh, I think one. one of the things that uh, will help me in determining uh, a little more about osteopathy would be I, I'm under the assumption that you work with other MDs at times. There's, a, I mean, if I was looking at myself from the outside, I would um, wonder. I'm going to say I would wonder what in the world I was doing, <laughs> because one, we're trained as a Western physician. I do prescribe medications. I refer more to Western doctors by a logarithmic amount than they refer to me. But it's really because they don't have a concept of the. I don't want to call it a gift, but uh, of the the vision that osteopathy harbors not only as a tool for allopathic medicine, but also as a tool for, this, for the, the person using it to embody, uh, and again, I, don't, I, I want to say it borders on a religion, but it borders on a religion that's actually a philosophy that's part of the practice of medicine. Mm. And it, it allows us to not lose our soul in the, in the art of practice, which I think is an integral part of medicine. Uh, you either have to put the heart back in after it's been removed. Or as an osteopath, you hope to have the heart built into your, your matrix of the practice as, as it develops and as you learn from the patients that you're, you're confronted with or confounded by. Let's talk about some cases maybe that you can give us examples of how uh, an osteopathic uh, physician would look at a case and work with someone different than, say, an MD or an allopathic doctor or chiropractor or acupuncturist. And we'll talk about whether you have a relationship with other fields like that later on. But uh, you mentioned that uh, our frontier doctor was taking care of people with cholera from a different point of view. So if somebody came to you with cholera today, how would you treat that differently using your osteopathic uh, spirituality, as you say? But the first thing I do, uh, Dr. Copernicus, is loosen the buttons on their cholera. <laughs> Sorry. But again, streaming, streaming and humor just don't go together. No, they do very well, and we appreciate that in this show. Uh, we'll just have to make sure that doesn't get edited out by our uh, brilliant wizard who missed the humor in it. I don't know. Maybe he's got a new name. Uh, uh, cholera would not make its way into my office. Um, I think there, there are two aspects of osteopathy that I find um, both 
exciting you know, like and it makes me uh, want to get up every morning and see patients and then there's another aspect which is also kind of a, a chasm that hasn't been filled uh, being able to treat people in need is extraordinarily difficult um, I think I heard somebody on the radio on the way here who was talking this morning who was talking about um, going to South Africa in order to do acupuncture on patients in an in, uh, in a needed uh, way and it has an inner city clinic or some kind of a clinic, but he had to have a private practice in order to fund that and ask for donations. And there's an aspect of osteopathy that is not funded by insurance companies. Mm. So the difficult part for me is to uh, find out how can I balance what it is that I love doing that I think is a great medical route for patients. Um, and I'll get into, if you focus me later, I'll get into what that uh, medical route is. But the disappointing part is that every once in a while, somebody comes in that comes that, that approaches me from a complete background that's socioeconomically not what I'm used to in, in, where, in the town that I practice, Santa Barbara, which is a pretty affluent community. Um, but someone could come in as with a, a money order for a fifth of the amount of the visits charge you know, less than Medicare would reimburse a physician for the office visit. And there's no re way I could ever say no to a patient like that who needed, who knew that they needed osteopathy for their child who had a, a birth defect or something like that, because Western medicine doesn't have an answer. Mm -hmm. So it's not that osteopathy has an answer, but we have a way of working with that patient from both perspectives, from looking at them as an anatomic creature that has the same needs as every human being trying to get the health of their body promoted, even though they may be in a state of active disease, you know, like cholera would, would lead a person. So as an osteopath, even though we pay attention to the disease and know what it may cause, you know, bloody flux or diarrhea or something in that specific example we used earlier with Dr. Still's treatment, we still want to pay attention to what we're finding within the individual, which may be unusual and make no sense in the context of that disease, but we're using science in its best form, which is direct empirical evidence-based medicine, you know, evidence is in our hands in front of us. So we're getting a direct contact with the patient, their experience, their emotional experience, their physical experience as represented through the way that they bring their body and throw it on the table or we watch them walk across the room. So we're getting kind of an insight into their background, their history, their culture, their genetics, their physiology, and it, it is very complicated, but you still reduce it to a simple model so that you can help, can help the person along. And then you have kind of criteria for health that we like to establish. So we say, are you feeling better? Because I'm feeling you're feeling better. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if it makes me feel good, I figure the patient must feel better. But it's not always true. No. Some people don't have a sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, give me, give us a... Uh... A little more of an example. You talked about someone that might come in with a birth defect that Western medicine has no uh, answer for. So give us give us an example of that, if you could, and then take us th through what they did maybe in Western medicine and how they got to you and then what you saw and how you were able to work with them. I'll keep it really concrete because, unfortunately, you know, my earphones feel like they're kind of atmospheric earphones at this point. But the, the idea that someone comes in with a birth defect is could be as simple as what a radiologist now would call normal an anatomic variant. An elf, the lower lumbar spine could accidentally fuse itself with the sacrum. Mm. And maybe it's just on one side. So that's something I've seen over and over again. If you saw a Western doctor or an orthopedist, they would just say that's a normal variant. And we would say it's a normal variant too. However, it is a congenital birth defect uh, by definition. And the way that it affects the human being is outrageous. In, in other words, it could cause things like a 10 to 20 year early degeneration of the same side hip. It could cause no back pain at all. It may only cause tendonitis in the, in the leg. But if you, if you looked at it as a category of disease without paying attention to what that actual construct or that actual anatomy did to the to the body as a whole you'd be missing what the patient was bringing in so it's a it's in a way it's returning to the roots 
making sure that you do your your do perfunctory exams as though you were a general practitioner, ask questions as though you're a neighbor, and then kind of further that along and say, but I'm a doctor too, because I went to medical school, at least I think I did, unless I'm, I'm having a, a fugue state. Um, so you can bring that into the patient's experience and say, uh, let's come up with a plan based on non-allopathic diagnosis. Let's come up with a plan based on allopathic diagnosis, and let's mediate between those two. Let's see if you and, uh, usually there's a bargain that you make with the patient, because if they don't like surgery, you're not going to get them to see a surgeon until they're absolutely necessary, uh, you know, until they actually kind of hit a bottom. It's like AA. When you hit the bottom, you go to AA. You can't really rely on somebody supporting you. And I think pain does that to a lot of patients. They have to hit the bottom first in order to motivate outside of their own belief system, which uh, I try to kind of be devil's advocate and sit on both sides of the fence and say, I think that doctor, you know, the neurosurgeon that we know over across the street or the orthopedist down the block would really like to kind of look at that film and see if he could offer a non-invasive, maybe a scopic treatment of the, of the low back. You know, if you had a sacral fusion, maybe you're just having neuroforaminal, you know, the nerve where the spine comes through, the opening where the spine comes through may just be narrow. So maybe the best osteopathic solution is removing the obstruction surgically rather than treating the patient for 18 years and then getting mad at how much work they went to and they still ended up having had surgery. Or they may be very delighted that they got to spend 18 years without a scalpel. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you have to come up with a plan with the person based on what they're willing to go through. I think we're at a point in Western medicine when, when, it, when almost... Oh, I don't know. I'd love to see the percentage, but my estimate would be 70 to 80% of most procedures are almost elective if you want to consider them that way. Mm. But you, if you were looking backwards the other way, if you just knew Western medicine, those aren't elective procedures. They just yeah. don't know what the other options are. Let's take, uh, so when you have that child that has the fusion on one side, would you start do, and and you didn't think that surgery might be the answer in this particular case, what would you do uh, to help them in terms of, and, is there anything you would do? Would you do uh, try and change form to change function? Would you do manipulation or adjustments, things like that over a period of time? You're going to hate this answer, but I, I can't. <laughs> I won't hate your answer. Uh, I would have to actually not even think about the patient if it was a child. I'd have to go right to the parent's belief system. Okay. Find out what they were willing to do on behalf of the child. Well, I didn't. I wouldn't want to sell them something they couldn't follow through on. So if I cost a thousand dollars a visit, which I don't, then and I told them it was necessary for that child to be treated until we felt there was no what we call somatic dysfunction, which the area kind of feels like the tissue moves past the obstruction. Um, and you can do that physically. You can do that by making suggestions of activity change. If I suggested that to the parents and kept that child captive in my own domain, I would have to be absolutely sure that what I was promising was going to be a future blessing, which I don't think anybody can do. So you can kind of sell them something that sounds like good common sense. Like, let's see the child back in three months to make sure that this is not becoming a chronic problem. Or, you know, don't worry about it now that the child grow up. When he starts or she starts to do physical education, before they start doing a lot of hammering and running during their adolescence and puberty, make sure to bring them back. Because if they're too loose, their joints are loose, at that time, they're going to start to do some significant damage. Whereas children, I mean, they're so happy most of the time if they're in a healthy household, that they should have enough allowances towards health that they're actually fixing themselves. We're just kind of tinkering, if you want to say. We're just kind of coaxing them. Strike, strike that tinkering from the record. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're actually just looking for them to inherit their health from the standpoint of removing obstruction. Hmm. Is, that, is that still clear? But you're, I'm, you're still, very I'm still working here. Uh, I still have a lot of, of interesting thoughts that are 
like sugar plums and things dancing through my head. But I need to I need to be a little more concrete in the process now. Uh, and maybe uh, another question about let's say that child who had the uh, anatomic variant from Western point of view versus uh, the uh, another variant from an osteopathic point of view, a defect. Let's say they never got treated and they came to you now as an adult with either the tendonitis, the back pain, the hip pain, an ankle problem, uh, a number of other things. How would you then look at them? Let's, and my guess is that let's say they've already gone to see the orthopedic surgeon, they've had the MRIs, they've seen the neurosurgeon, uh, they've tried the therapy, physical therapy, they've um, been on medications, and someone mentioned that, hey, maybe you should go see Dr. Uh, Timothy Schultz. So that person now comes to your office, uh, and you, what do you do? I think the, uh, the construct would be to review the records because I, I used to always trust that people who were in a specialty knew more than I did. And then I, after years of practice and finding little loopholes and assuming that that was right, but then checking later, getting stories from patients, people calling back over the years, is oftentimes that the specialist is just doing their best job in the specialty, but without deference to origins of pain. So the, for instance, if a person came in, I would want to make sure that we had at least a plain film to re-verify that that was a congenital, you know, L5S1. And I wouldn't let the radiologist interpret it. I would make sure I interpret it myself. And that, I'm not trained as a radiologist, but when I have discussions with the radiology friends that I've acquired through use of telephone and harassment, <laughs> um, are you sure this isn't a this normal anatomy or am I, so I've, I've gotten a little bit of read experience. So I would want to make sure that what I was feeling was, was, or wasn't really there. You can do a palpatory diagnosis. You can confirm it with radiology. Sometimes the two don't feel like they're confirmatory. So if the patient came in, I would want to one, be an osteopath, feel what it was that was going on in the hip joint as a result of the sacrum and the ilium, the sacrum and the, the lumbar spine getting too close. Um, I would want to make sure I understood what their activities were, why it might even feel worse than it is, because who knows, maybe they were a paratrooper in their previous life. Trauma is extremely important in someone's um, disposition, even though it's 30, 40 years later. You still get information about what area to look for in a gymnast or a parachuter or someone who's played you know, active football or a loose-jointed person who likes to play tennis. It doesn't mean that you'll be able to fix them with passive osteopathic techniques, but you might be able to refer them to the right person, like a physical therapist for stability or a prolotherapist for stability or a surgeon for, you know, the, the reasons that you can't quite remedy with a, a um, what do you want to say, non-invasive methodology. There's an orthopedist named Centenario in Colorado who came up with, I think he works for a prolotherapy business, but he came up with a protocol called Orthopedics 2.0, which is freely downloadable. And it's a nice um, treatise on the spectrum of body care through massage, self-massage, jinsenjutsu, rolfing, uh, Feldenkrais, and the spectrum of the other palpatory modalities as seen through a physician's eyes uh, from the standpoint of, in his case, I think a prolotherapist, maybe an orthopedist. But that spectrum that kind of is the gray zone um, is the, if you'd want to say it's the embodiment of most people's problems, is just that the specialist is on either end of the spectrum, usually on the end of surgery rather than on the end of, yeah, but you could probably uh, sit down when you brushed your teeth and you wouldn't have such a bad headache every night. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's a simple solution. I got lost. Sorry, the teeth brushing completely erased the question from my. Where were we again? <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, it's like dental floss or something. We've oh, moved good. on. Uh, I I'm trying to understand that when the person comes to you as an adult, you will analyze them, try and figure out the problems, and once you have what you consider 
a diagnosis, at least a working or a differential diagnosis, then you start uh, doing things. And the things that you do might be uh, changing physical activity, being aware, maybe nutritional changes, maybe prescriptions. Do you do any manipulative or manipulative types of procedures? And if you do, are they different or similar to a chiropractic type of manipulation? I saw a chiropractor when I was in college, and I know that we learn modalities called high-velocity, low-amplitude techniques. And that's kind of the, if you had to stereotype a profession, which I don't think it's fair for anybody to do, um, I, I equate most chiropractors with some kind of an adjustment that says, if your body was not in that position, uh, we could kind of maybe take a little bit of the pain uh, away by aligning the facets, by making, giving them balance or something like that. An osteopath learns those modalities and sometimes actually kind of relies on them as a standard for their practice. And I didn't, I wasn't one of those osteopaths. To me, they, it saves a lot of time. So the patient visits can be shortened, but the, the level of, of diagnosis goes down by um, a large stripe. Mm. So for me, if I, if I can't spend the time to diagnose a patient, I can't treat them. So a lot of the patients that I see will ask me, is this the treatment? And I'll say, yes. And they'll say, isn't this the diagnosis? And I'll say, yes. Because the two should be so close to each other that if, you're, if you know how to receive a treatment after, you know, usually patients are kind of complicated. They come in and some people plop down on the table and they fall asleep. Other people are anxious. And if I touch one area that's hypersensitive, they stiffen up for five minutes. Some people actually just lay on the table and after 15 minutes, their body feels as good as if I had treated them. So observing those things uh, is really important in the way that you come up with an allopathic and an osteopathic diagnosis. So if you have a patient that's, that's completely relaxed, that's a good start. If they're asleep, that's even better start. However, if they're asleep and they can hear you talking, that's a narcoleptic. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and we had Dr. Andrew Binder who gave us a nice uh, talk on that. I have, that was his patient I was referring to. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there's a way of making a diagnosis that's non-invasive, that makes a person feel like they're being cared for, that uh, allows them to feel like if you'd want to say that even though you have no idea what the person's doing, who's about evaluating you, it doesn't feel like they've just made an assumption um, from an intellectual vantage point only. Um, and that that opportunity of kind of putting the, again, I don't want to be corny, but putting the soul or the heart back into medicine goes a long way, not only with patient um, diagnosis, but it also goes a long way with the rapport that you have for the people you're taking care of. Mm. Because otherwise, you, you literally are an industry that's going to drive a country into do great things. You have technology. But if you're not that person who can interrelate, you will just be another, if you want to say, it, another example of why cataract surgery is so great, because you can see again. But you won't understand why, you know, your, your cataract had something to do with your depth perception or had something to do with why your neck got torticollis or why you couldn't quite look at your family the same way when you got to that age of the cataracts. It could be a different embodiment philosophical embodiment of an emotional pattern, of a physical pattern that's wrapped up into the same thing. And in osteopathy, it's, to me, it's the, the, it is the essence of the profession to be able to look behind the curtains and see, see the essence of, a, of something that somebody won't tell you because you're a stranger. Then uh, when people, you said you had mentioned that you, you make referrals to MDs. Sometimes you see something that an orthopedic surgeon, a neurosurgeon might be able to operate on and get the person relief. Uh, MDs make referrals to you. you. You mentioned that a little bit. What type of cases do they refer to you? Uh, usually ones that they're not sure that they have a good diagnosis or, on the other hand, they don't have a good surgery for it. I think someone said it best who was a surgeon. They said the first 10 years, any surgeon is really capable 
of doing a, a brilliant surgery. They're just gaining experience. The second 10 years, you try to find out who's the best patient to do the surgery on. In the last 10 years of practice, you try to find out who not to do the surgery on. Because <laughs> with years of practice, you want to avoid problems. <laughs> that was and a nice, uh, it's a nice, nice story there. So I, I think um, for me, when someone comes in and have, has been referred by a physician one, I feel really honored because I think they might actually know what I do. I'm usually surprised to find out that when they go back to talk to the uh, physician, the patient still has a hard time describing what I do in allopathic terms. So they, they don't come up with a better vision. Uh, I think one of the best ways Harvard has a course for allopathic and osteopathic physicians in neuromusculoskeletal medicine. And if Harvard's offering a course like that in their med school, you know, it's not alternative medicine anymore. It's actually part of mainstream medicine. But the fact that people don't know it is, is the surprising part to me. It's just, we are 78,000 osteopaths in the country or physicians who are osteopathic. And of that 78,000, 881 of us have neuromusculoskeletal degrees or, or specialties. So not to say that the rest of them don't do any manipulation they just don't do dermatology. You know, if, if you're an orthopedist, you don't do dermatology. You don't feel like you're an expert, but you still have skin. Mm -hmm. So if you have a funny looking mole, you know, as an orthopedist, they'll say go to see the dermatologist. Mm -hmm. If we had a funny looking condition, I would expect an orthopedist to say that might be thoracic outlet. You know, maybe if you saw an osteopath, we don't have a good way of treating that allopathically. We don't have a surgery necessarily because we can't find a specific. You know, you can't find a rib that you've inherited that's an extra rib, or we can't find a nerve that's being pinched. So maybe try functional medicine. And that, unfortunately, I think right now, because there's so many more physical therapists that are well-trained as doctorate, uh, you can send somebody to a DPT and let them manage your patient. And that's a funny thing, because are they doctors? Well, they kind of are. But the insurance companies like the patient to have a referral could they be their own doctors? Or, and that may be a new development in the next 10 years. It's maybe physical therapists will start running their own healthcare uh, companies as you know, ad adjunct physicians, kind of like physician's assistants. And osteopath still is kind of in that weird category of internationally, we're always different. The UK has 4,500 registered DOs uh, that practice just manipulation. They're not trained in medicine, but they really are good manipulation they are kind of more akin to the chiropractor in this country and in germany you can either be a say for instance you can be an osteopath who's trained as a helicopractor under that law or you can be an md who's also a do who's trained as both so you can see why the international community is different in every country the united states is kind of the only one or one of how many i think there's there's 40 full licenses i think in the world um, and we're the, we're the kind of ones that are invisible because there's so few of us who do the osteopathic part. We don't, we don't necessarily push that to the forefront because we're, you know, we're kind of the, what do they call those guys? The, the old gray tanks. Uh, <laughs> the things that are kind of rusting in the backyard. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, I, I have to say, I am, I've been so quiet here because I'm thoroughly fascinated. I'm, I would not have encompassed so much under that one title. I mean, as, as uh, Glenn in our audience very well knows, I'm very much into the acupuncture and the natural medicines, etc. And to find out how what you do really spans the whole range, but also into the allopathic world. Uh, I'm fascinated. I, I'm truly fascinated here. Um, is there a certain age group that you tend to deal with more? It's a great question because the kids are the ideal candidate because as the twig and, as as the twig is bent, so doth the tree incline. And mm. quote, whoever that was, Alexander Pope. So that's the best age that you could possibly, if you wanted to, if you want to say have a good reincarnation as an osteopath, <laughs> <laughs> you go for that group. Uh, to a certain extent, it's really hard to work on. For me, it's hard to work on children, mainly because the parental interface, the cost of doing business as a child, in a maybe in a non-insured situation, um, and then the belief system that I have to instill in patients that I kind of feel 
I have to be such a teacher and so clear. And as you can see, the concept's hard to convey. At least mm -hmm. for me. I don't want to be dogmatic and say, you know, treat this child. You know, they're going to grow up with a handicap and all the other kids are going to point at them and say, look at that squirrely kid with limp. Mm -hmm. um, because that's not necessarily what I think would happen. But on a certain degree, if I feel like a child really is in danger, you know, in physical danger from a circumstance like like a, uh, a visual disturbance or, I mean, hearing is obvious. It's, that's already been co-opted by the pediatricians, uh, how important the senses are in childhood. But if somebody's actually got a physical disability that is going to make the rest of their life unfurl in an unusual way, there's an orthopedic condition called uh, femoral acetabular impingement. In certain people, they inherit a large uh, trochaic, a large neck of the femur. If the neck is large enough, it'll drag on the tendons in the hip and cause premature uh, hip osteoarthritis and hip failure, usually anywhere from 10 to 20 years early, maybe 15. Wow. Um, but the fact that that's known is still debated in certain orthopedic circles. The reason why it's debated is because I only know of one arthroscopic orthopedist in the Los Angeles area. Maybe there's more, but nobody really does that surgery. So can you offer the patient, but mm -hmm. come back when you need a hip replacement? Oh. And that's usually what people say. Whereas there is a lot of things one can do uh, while you're degenerating. <laughs> 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 to be in business, but a lot of things you can do that actually kind of alleviate the body sensing that there's danger. Sorry. I mean, I'm uh, so I I believe in in preventative. So I tend to like, you know, I, I, I like to go see a doctor and make sure all the tests are done and everything is running smooth, et cetera. And with the child is the same thing. I mean, do you believe in that? I mean, do patients come in that seem or look thoroughly healthy for you to do an analysis or a test on as well and a series of tests? Correct. Yeah, there, to be an expert in the in the field of chemistry, especially blood chemistry, is you, know, you can do the screens because the, the chemistry kind of speak themselves. The interpretation of the chemistry is the hard part. Mm -hmm. So if somebody comes in as a child and has an unusually high um, inflammatory, um, there's a, you know, the SED rate or the C-reactive protein would be elevated, you know, that would make me want to send to somebody who's the best capable of taking care of that abnormality from a Western medical standpoint, but if they had a high set rate and were having a problem at the same time, say for instance, um, they had a, 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 with a polio patient, sometimes you have a lot of inflammation. We don't see much polio anymore, but say for instance, a joint had failed. Um, you can sometimes create inflammation from myoglobin and tissue breakdown that will cause, uh, you want to say a symptom that would be parallel to that serum laboratory that you found. So it, you can send them to make sure they're getting the best care in terms of, does this child have a genetic problem, which I, I don't have a lot of insight about. Does this child have a, a problem with a rheumatic disease that could be cared for with a medication? You have to think of what you're going to present to patients with a long-term solution mm -hmm. in a case where somebody might have a really innocent, you know, I stubbed my toe and I can't walk for three weeks. My son broke his leg when he was in third grade. And the funny part was, is that he felt like he couldn't, he wanted to be in a wheelchair for almost two months. And I would try to treat him and he'd say, you can't touch that. It doesn't feel like it goes together anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I talked to a couple of radiologists. He said that usually happens only in adult patients where you feel the bone knitting together. Mm -hmm. But this, you know, my son had a very perceptual field. He could feel that the bone wasn't knitting together. Emotionally, that really kind of, made him psychologically freaked out by putting weight on it. So he would much prefer being shuttled around and, and who wouldn't? So those kind of disabilities kind of accumulate in his, I use it as an example, because he didn't necessarily use a strategy for promoting his own health that Western Med would say to do, get on your leg and walk around and run and you know, kind of stabilize it that way. Mm -hmm. Instead, he was kind of more careful and needed to kind of test his waters and that was important for his psychologic, you know, component rather than just physical component. But sometimes you have to punt and say, I think this child is, is really more afraid of putting weight on the foot than they are of, uh, if you'd want to say, of uh, 
fracturing again. There's an irrational fear. And let's see if we can't tease them into, you know, chase them with a wildcat or something across the room. Uh, anyway, the, the strategy can be as important, I think, as the, as the patient's condition, if it's really not something that you know what to do with from the back, you know, operating backwards from, we know the diagnosis, we know what that's going to cause. You better do this if you want a good outcome. But mm -hmm. Accumulating the information mm -hmm. would be the, the best. So any, any age for me is, is a pleasant age to treat. And yesterday I saw an 81-year-old that looked like he was probably in his, if I was blind and I felt his body, I would have guessed he was 46 or seven. Oh my gosh. I asked him and I said, you know, what, what makes you so healthy? And he says, I'm healthy. Said, <laughs> Maybe he should meet the uh, yoga and tango <laughs> dancer. Our 89 year old tango dancer. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> we, we, we could have a new program of uh, medical dating. <laughs> <laughs> Sending referrals through your uh, healer. <laughs> Tim, do you, uh, refer to alternative or integrative healers uh, like acupuncturists or uh, chiropractors or uh, naturopaths or does what osteopathy do encompass those in certain ways it's my imp coming out again you know i love questions because they're kind of like flies and gnats and birds at the same time you have to separate into their own camps but now, I don't usually refer to modalities, although I find acupuncture to be magical and, in a sense, 3,000 year old osteopathy that kind of happened in a different culture in a different uh, time period. Because mm. I think that the, 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 the modalities are more important and then followed closely behind, if not in front, sometimes is the person who's the practitioner matched with the patient who's going to see the practitioner. And I can't, I can't do match.com. I'm a horrible, what's that term when you're called matchmaker? <laughs> Chick or something. I don't know. I, I know there's a word for it. But I'm a horrible matchmaker, but I do kind of see where somebody could actually kind of have an opening of information that could lead them into a different direction from a physical standpoint. And occasionally people don't like to be touched. Um, so that person is a great uh, acupuncture referral. Not that acupuncture doesn't touch patients, but they do it in a very, very different way. That's it's it's much more clinical than an osteopath. If you if you have somebody that's very sense driven or hypersense driven, like an ADD child, or uh, sometimes that hypersensitivity makes it difficult for them to participate at the level you'd like them to participate in as a as an osteopathic physician. But you know, you you get a few opportunities on every patient visit. Uh, but there are modalities that seem better. And there's sometimes the modalities that seem like they would work the quickest are the ones that I try to, I kick somebody out on that first visit uh, and send them to an alternative practitioner of a different sort. Either, I mean, there's all sorts of things that I can refer to. There's a person who does something called body talk. There's another person who does unity and motion in town. There's very excellent massage people that can work kind of more on a personal level that aren't diagnostic. And if I don't think the patient needs um, medical care, or if that I'm not the best person to administer for that type of person, then I can, you know, it is matchmaking. It's like, I think you need to see this person or a young girl might see me and think, Oh, that's a freaky guy. He's got a whitish beard and he's got beady little eyes. <laughs> he's a Dr. Schultz and he's younger than I thought. I thought he was going to be an old man with a white, you know, completely like white beard. So sometimes they'll I try to find a female practitioner that they might be more Mm. So sometimes that process makes it, as Desik Char said, a yogi, uh, that true healing usually occurs best among peers. Mm. I, I can resort to being childish. <laughs> <laughs> You've done a great job with us. You know, uh, with each of our guests, we always want to take the journey that they've been on and see if they can offer to our uh, viewers a special health tip. And I'm wondering, with your vast experience and your knowledge coming from so many different areas, if you have something that you can offer us today. Oy vey. Yeah. Is that it? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's already you been given. It. I think Christina offered that once. You spell it backwards and divide by pi. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have a, I'll tell you what, what comes to mind is this morning before I left, 
going to treat my first patient before I did this program with, with a few kind of people, um, there was an image stuck on a computer as I was closing it, and it just stared back at me. And it, it was an image of a plastic flower that looked real next to a, as you said earlier, a roll of dental floss. And it looked like it was in two frying pans. And I thought, what is that? You know, why did my daughter take a picture of dental floss, uh, plastic flowers in what looks like a frying pan? I said, where is that, Oli? And she said, oh, that's from your car. And I have cupboards that uh, has a little dental floss because what can I say? Sometimes things just that come in don't get all the way down or need to come out. <laughs> so I carried in the car and I, I looked at the two, the dental floss and that little rose or whatever it was. And I said, oh, floss a flower. <laughs> <laughs> so I realized that the reason it was staring back at me was it wanted me to interact with it. And I think that, you know, you know, we're doing the same thing here. We're all philosophy flowers and we're looking at each other. We're kind of having an inanimate experience, but we're embodying, you know, some really good feelings <laughs> underneath it all. So as a health tip, I don't know how you can do it. You know, what part of your mind you have to go to or what part of your mind you have to get out of. But the symbolic representation of things that kind of become meaningful in your life and create a story, at least for me, is a good, uh, it's a good way to move on to the next moment. So sorry, that's it's kind of a health tip, but then again, I guess you got to do do something to create that. Just hopefully, it doesn't hurt when you hit your head that hard. <laughs> <laughs> that's what the frying pan's for. <laughs> that's what the frying pan was for. <laughs> Double <the> fry. <laughs> so before uh, before we close, uh, you had asked me to remind you about talking about a medical route or route, and I also wanted to offer this opportunity. In case there was something you really wanted to tell all of us that we didn't uh, bring up today, so here's an opportunity for both of those. Uh, I think if we knew the scale of the universe, it would be really helpful to know what to do next. Uh, and the thing that fascinates me is that nobody really does. They we live in it because we experience it, but when you think about um, there's a guy that I read yesterday, I reviewed his article, so I, I could be fresh about my hands because an osteopath without hands is like a, a flower without floss. It's, <laughs> it's only halfway alive anyway. But the osteopath without hands, hands are so sensitive that the amount at, uh, at the MIT lab headed by this guy named Sri, Srivasana, I think is his name, it's called the, the Human and machine haptics lab. He's looked at how, how much can we feel with our fingers. And if, if there's any doubt in your mind about trusting what we feel, the amount that your fingertips can pick up is on the order of 75 nanometers, which is less than the wavelength of most light. Light is about, visible light is 600 nanometers. So when you think about feeling a bump of texture with your fingertip, you're actually communicating directly with your brain that something different has just happened on the magnitude that's as exquisite as hearing, vision, uh, and probably smell, although I couldn't. They're all within the same realm of that nanometer, which is close proximity to where, uh, where kind of essence, you know, where our, our perceived essence kind of starts. So if, if we have that scale, relatively uh, tuned there's a lot that you can feel that may not that your brain may not even detect that for instance i could my my eyes went across the screen and the philosophy and the flower i mean to me I, I even dressed up like a philosopher one time with a lot of philosophy <laughs> in my team, uh, so I, I already have that paradigm embedded <laughs> i know what to look for i know what to feel but what does it mean and how does that meaning affect the person that you're treating uh, osteopathically by using your sense of touch to bring that back to their own awareness. It's, um, it shouldn't be something that always needs to be verbally communicated. And I think the essence of osteopathy and why it hasn't been understood for so many years is that one, it changes like crazy because it's way, like you said, the ideas just zigzag back and forth. But at the same time, uh, 
the scale of what we're trying to to teach is not easily verbalized. It's metaphoricalized. You know, we can. I love to tell metaphors during a, a session, and people, you know, they smile. Oh, cute doctor. He likes meta metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> but to me, they're actually a really important lyrical part of the poetry of interacting with another person on that kind of a level. Uh, that sometimes what your hands are feeling is really something that you can't express. And if you say, for instance, the question that everybody would ask would be, well, then can you feel a very small tumor at the very beginning? Anybody can feel a very small tumor at the very beginning, but the, the, the ability and the responsibility that comes with that is so overwhelming that most brains would get sick in a hurry if they had to do that for a patient. Some people are given that gift. And I feel sorry for those people who are given that gift without proper training because they're ground, they're, they're the sinkhole beneath them if they don't somehow embody themselves through that process with a lot of harder and educational activity, you know, really erodes their foundation. So I, I, can, I know of people who can feel very, very, very small things, um, but they usually don't share that with the patients. It's not, it's not the kind of responsibility that we would unless we knew it to be true, we, we wouldn't feel responsible at disseminating the information. So there's a little bit of a, a muzzle over us, muzzle top, you know, boy, they and muzzle top, there's the next one. <laughs> <laughs> we have a interesting, we have a hand specialist that we're going to be interviewing in a few weeks. So it might be interesting to ask a few of those questions that you're bringing up and have some discussions on a different level. I, I, Christina, I any thoughts? Oh, no, I, I'm still in this la-la land of, of piecing everything together right now. There's like, you've just shared this whole wealth of information, Dr. Schultz, that, that I, as a layman, am sitting here just trying to piece it together. Like, okay, now who and what and when and how, you know, does all this work? It's amazing. If you ever, I mean, how to find an osteopath is hard because you can go through the Cranial Academy, which is, you know, www.cranialacademy.org. That finds people who specialize more in the cranial concept, mm -hmm. expanding the osteopathic concept. If you go through the American Osteopathic Association, the AOA, you'll find the whole broad range, 78,000. If you go through the American Academy of Osteopathy, you find people that are really interested in genuinely using their hands but don't think it's a medical specialty. So probably would not always be board certified in neuromusculoskeletal medicine. They just see it as part of physician's practice. Mm. Mm. So those I mean, are the, the range three. is so vast. It's unbelievable. It's, that's why I'm like, okay, so <laughs> is the when, breath that I have to take in the moment to kind of decipher everything that I've learned right now. The good news is by 2014, one out of three physicians in the country will be osteopathically trained. Oh, or a sense. So the, the, the numbers are growing exponentially because primary care is being under underrepresented in our healthcare communities. So we're trying, the osteopathic community as a social mission is trying to train family physicians so that they can take care of the needs of the nation that will come, you know, come before us before we know it. Mm, mm, so, very interesting. So it keeps going on and on, sorry, but... Uh, Everything needs to come to a close, but please dig on. DO stands for dig on. Find out about osteopathy. Find out why we aren't more popular. You know, why, you know, you can keep a nest egg, but why are you so afraid to hatch it? <laughs> <laughs> I think on that note, I would like to say how grateful uh, we are to our special guest, Dr. Timothy Schultz, sharing his wisdom, wisdom and expertise with us. I also want to thank all of my healers and teachers who have helped me to uh, continue on my journey. Looking forward to getting together with all of you and Christina next week as we explore another quadrant of the healthcare galaxy. And until that time, I would like to thank our guest again and wish you all optimal health. Yes. Thank, thank you, Tim. <clears throat> thank you, Tim, Dr. Schultz, for, thank you. Uh, for a fascinating hour and a half almost it's like you could go on and on and and thank you of course glenn um we invite everyone to join us every tuesday here live at 10 30 a.m pacific time 1 30 eastern standard time 
Um, and of course, you can always find our show um, schedule on our site um, by going directly to yogahub.us forward slash schedule. And um, of course, we have uh, Wednesdays at uh, for Trinity of Life at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Look forward to seeing you there as well um, on all the different shows and all the different wonderful wisdom keepers and other modalities of health and wellness. You can also find Dr. Glenn Woolman at myyogahub.com forward slash G Woolman. And on Twitter, his handle is at Glenn Woolman, all one word. And of course, his own website, glennwoolman.com. And be sure when you go there to learn about his metaphor square breath. Until next week, thank you everyone. Uh, for joining us today and we look forward to spending time with you again. Namaste. Namaste.